Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan, and it's time once again to add some new acquisitions to the ever vast and ominous comic book vault. I've got six books for you today, and I want to jump right into it with a new independent book that was sent to me by Septagon Studios. This is a book called Archaeologists of Shadows. It's available right now for uh, digital purchase. Uh, you can get the digital version of this. It's uh, 100 pages for 99 cents. It's absolutely fantastic, and uh, it will the artwork will totally blow you away, or uh, hopefully it will. It certainly did me. Um, Archaeologists of Shadows is by uh, Laura Fountas and Patricio Clary. Hopefully I'm pronouncing those names correctly. And uh, this thing is apparently five years in the making. What it does is it takes a whole lot of different uh, art media together to create these absolutely astounding and breathtaking uh, pictures of this uh, steampunk world, and uh, I'm told by the president of Septagon, uh, Nick Defina, that the art style combines drawing, sculpture, photography, photo manipulation, and digital painting. And uh, you can see what the end result is of that for yourself. It's absolutely brilliant. And uh, what the book does is it takes this steampunk world and it has um, all these people that are all mostly mechanized. And the idea is, it's, it's this very um, religious-driven story where there is... The, um, everyone in the society believe in these gods, and they think that, some of them think, that their gods have called them to all become mechanized, so that uh, there is no organic matter left, and everyone has to become machines. And some people are more resistant to this than others. One thing I really like about this book is that even though our heroes are uh, pretty much, y y the idea seems to be that, you know, becoming totally mechanized is bad and you lose your individuality and you're, you're controlled by the state and um, it's somewhat of a Borg kind of concept, uh, but what I like is that the book does play both sides a little bit. Uh, it, it does uh, show characters talking about how now they're now that they're mechanized, they, they don't have disease anymore, they can they can live a long time, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, so I, I really like that it has a broader scope and gives you this this uh, this sense of, of this very large uh, and very compelling world that really sucked me in. And uh, when the first uh, part of this was over, uh, I, I wanted to keep reading on. I, I, I hated that it was done. It's 100 pages, uh, but there's only about 50 or 60 pages of story. Uh, after that, there's uh, dozens of pages of concept art and um, a lot of uh, fascinating stuff about the process it took uh, of the creators to create this book. And um, anyway, I absolutely recommend it. Um, some of the... Uh, Another thing I really like about this is that I uh, it's it's about the um, it's about the resistance uh, of um, the like this underground resistance to the government trying to mechanize everyone and um, you get by the way this uh, you get a lot of science fiction concepts and, and and honestly this is a this is kind of like the science fiction book I've been waiting for um, it, it really knows what it's doing with its with its sci-fi and I like that it includes um, some of uh, Asimov's ideas uh, the third law is is talked about in this where once you become a hundred percent mechanized you're not resistant anymore at all because um, of, of the third law which is uh, self-preservation but it's self-preservation of being mechanized of the of, of the robotic parts uh, because there's no more organic left and um I thought that that was all absolutely fascinating and it's a really interesting blend of religious ideas, political ideas, science fiction ideas and um it's uh, I don't know it's pretty deep stuff. I uh, it it uh the artwork, there's definitely, uh, I think, a little bit of an influence from, like, uh, Mike Mignola, and uh, it also reminded me a little bit of uh, that Tim Burton uh, film from a couple years back, uh, Nine. And actually, this, in a lot of ways, is kind of, in, in my mind, what Nine should have been. Um, I gotta tell you, if this doesn't get optioned for, uh, for a computer-generated movie, I would be very, very surprised, and I think it absolutely needs to be. And uh, I hope it gets all of the national acclaim that it deserves, because uh, it's just breath it's breathtaking to look at and um, it's uh, it's a world that really that really sucked me in uh, I, I, I gotta say uh, I was more taken in by the by the world itself than uh, by any of the individual characters and I'm sure a as it goes along and the uh, and the two uh, twins that we follow who are on a quest to figure out how not only to not get mechanized but also to become 
um, completely 100% organic again. And there's a lot of talk about is that possible and how can you do that. Um, I'm sure that as time goes goes along, these characters will be more fleshed out, and I, and I'll see them uh, as a little bit less of archetypes that, that I do right now. Um, there, I mean, there there are people that I feel like I've kind of seen before, but not in a bad way. Um, there there's there's definitely uh, some of these classic ideas like um, like uh, you know maybe they're the chosen ones and uh, they seem to have something to do with you know a major prophecy in this religion but then they're against the idea of being mechanized so the the question really becomes who's right you know do do, do the gods really want um, really want people to become mechanized or not and then you get the sense without giving it away by the end that maybe we're actually going to learn that and we're actually going to find out about these gods uh, and whether or not they really exist and, and, and all of that so um yeah, I thought it was. I, I thought it was amazing. Um, there's these. There's these really cool details too. Like, uh, like we see these big signs. There's all of these great cityscapes uh, that 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 remind me of you know other steampunk things and even like uh, Fritz Lang's Metropolis a little bit here and there. Only a little bit more. Well, I was gonna say more like industrial, but that was kind of industrial too. So, um, so yeah, de it definitely reminded me a little bit of Metropolis. But you get these really cool details like, uh, like there's these big signs that are just barcodes. And um, anyway, uh, it's a great book, and uh, you definitely should check it out, especially because uh, it's only 99 cents if you want to read it right now. And uh, I, th I, I think um, I've seen pictures of a uh, of a print book, but I don't think that's out yet. So um, look for that. I'm definitely going to buy that when it comes out. Uh, I, I really want to have that for myself. I think it's I think it's great, and um, and uh, I really don't think that the screen does this justice. I really want to see this on glossy pages, and. Um, the uh, second part of this comes out on September 10th, so uh, be looking for that if you enjoyed this, and uh, I'd really like to hear what people have to say about it. I think it's I think it's fantastic. So let's jump into the uh, mainstream stuff now. Um, Amazing Spider-Man number 692. This is the big giant 50th, uh, 50th anniversary um, issue, and um, I gotta say I wasn't too horribly impressed with this. Um, this introduces Spider-Man's new sidekick, Alpha, which I've been kind of dreading. I don't love the idea of Spider-Man having a sidekick, and now that I've seen him, I still don't love the idea of Spider-Man having a sidekick. Uh, it's a taste issue. I don't love this idea, especially because it's yet another one of Dan Slott's uh, Spider-Man screws up and has to deal with some something that happened because he was an idiot stories. And um, I don't know, I'm just... I'm getting a little bit tired of those uh, for, for, from Dan Slott because um, it, it's making it seem like Peter Parker never learns anything about anything. It's just constantly, oh, it's my fault, it's my fault, it's my fault, and then you get to the next issue and everything is still his fault. Totally different, unrelated things because he never learns anything from what happened before. And um, anyway, uh, maybe Alpha will turn into a really cool character as time goes on. Um, right now, uh, basically the idea is this kid gets uh, these powers because um, Peter Parker uh, screwed up and created a particle that he shouldn't have created. And this kid was uh, at the, um, was that like the symposium where he was talking about it? A bad thing happens there and he ends up with these powers. Uh, and the reason he's called Alpha is because apparently... Um, he's like tied into the universe so that as the universe expands and grows so too do, do, do his powers and um, he's just kind of this uh, nothing kid that never amounted to anything before this and um, and uh, now he has powers and he's getting in over his head like you would expect um, that's pretty much that part of the issue and then there's a couple of other uh, little short stories about um, one of them is one of them's kind of fun. Uh, it's it's by uh, Dean Haspiel and uh, art by uh, by uh, Gila Brusco. I don't I don't know him, but um, but I, I like the art in this in the section quite a bit actually. And uh, what it does is uh, it takes the Spider-Man No More story and it has this guy who is uh, who's robbing places and he stumbles upon Spider-Man's costume when he puts it in that trash can from the cover and then he goes and puts it on and then uh, without giving anything away he uh, he ends up deciding that um, what he's doing is wrong and he ends up uh, taking the costume back off and putting it back in the trash can. Uh, I thought that was kind of fun. And then uh, the story in the back about um, Peter Parker trying to save people that don't really need to be saved. Um, 
it's okay. Uh, honestly, I would say uh, this this issue, uh, even though it's this big, oversized, um, you know, you know, epic six dollar thing, it's really not all that epic. I think it's skippable. Um, I didn't hate it, but if you're not really reading slot stuff right now, and you thought that this was going to be this this really uh, amazing, great 50th anniversary issue, uh, I think it's skippable. Okay, um, moving on. Here's Ninja Turtles number 13. Uh, we've still got Waltz on writing, but uh, the artist has left, and now we are joined by. Our artist Andy Kuhn. And I gotta tell you, um, I am gonna need some time for this art to grow on me. It's a little sketchier than what I usually like. Uh, it's, it's stylistic, it's not a bad style, um, but I would appreciate a little bit more detail in this book. Um, it, it took me a while to get used to the art to the art before, which I also thought was a little bit sketchy that I would have liked, but this is even going further in that direction, and so I'm not real keen on this artist yet, but maybe I'll, I'll like him as time goes on. Um, I do wish that there wasn't so much blank space in the backgrounds. There, there's not a lot of detail in the backgrounds. Sometimes it's just straight blank, uh, blank colors, and um, I'm not real excited about that. Uh, however, uh, story-wise, I'm extremely excited. There, there's some great follow-up stuff going on from uh, what we learned at the end of 12. I really like that this isn't just uh, just a little fill-in issue to get us in, you know, before we get into the next big arc. This really does set up a lot of things to come, and it uh, ties up a lot of things that we really were wondering about um, it will not really ties things up but um, but it really uh, it really starts stuff going with Krang and um, there's a big giant reveal about Krang and Krang species which I'm not going to uh, to get into Oh, I also wanted to mention that this opens with maybe the funniest uh, visual I've seen for anything Ninja Turtles in a long time, which is the Ninja, the Ninja Turtles playing Twister. I think that's hilarious. How could you possibly get your arms over a shell being also that big and bulky? And I just, I think that's hilarious. Next up, Star Trek number 12. Uh, I bought this because I wanted to see the end of The Truth About Tribbles, which is still a uh, really, uh, really fun story. Uh, once again, I really like that they didn't just do The Trouble with Tribbles, but they actually came up with their own story for this new Abrams universe and what uh, what we've got in this issue is we uh, Kirk is has now been alerted uh, by Admiral Pike to the fact that Scotty sent a Tribble to San Francisco and that the Tribbles are multiplying and they're taking over and uh, meanwhile he's dealing with the same thing on his ship and he has to uh, deal with defusing a Klingon bomb down on the Tribble homeworld and uh, anyway uh, and wackiness ensues. Uh, this is a great fun comic book and uh, it definitely lives up to what was going on in the uh, in, in the first issue uh, that I loved so much. Uh, there is one in, in discrepancy um, from the movie about um, about uh, Ambassador Spock. Uh, I won't get into that here, but uh, but but there, there was there was this thing that that. Uh, that uh, Spock mentions about how Admiral Spock uh, won't tell them anything about the Tribbles or anything else for that matter because he doesn't want to mess with the timeline, which I don't really understand because the timeline's already kind of been messed with, but anyway. Um, and uh, that's all I want to say about this. Uh, you should read it if you like Star Trek. It's fun, and it's everything I was wanting this comic book to be from the beginning. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about uh, briefly is Venom number 23. Uh, Colin Bunn has now totally taken over uh, this book. Uh, now that that um, now that Rick Remender has left, and um, the beginning of this feels very much like kind of a recap issue. It's like if you haven't been reading this book, uh, here is all the stuff you need to know to keep going. And it also feels a little bit like Colin Bunn kind of getting his bearings a little bit. Like now I'm on this book, and I'm by writing this, I'm reminding myself of uh, of, of everything that happened that I need to build on. And um, that's all fine. All I wish was that the cover had said, you know, like the start of a new uh, of, of a new uh, direction for the book or a start of, of, of a new uh, story arc. It does it does say Monsters of Evil Part 1, but I mean, like, this would be a really great jumping on point for anybody who didn't read Remender's Run. Now, you need to read Re Remender's Run. It's absolutely fabulous. But, uh, but you know, in case you wanted to just start reading now, I just think that it should have said that somewhere on the, on the cover, uh, considering how much recap there really is in this. Um... I'm not immediately crazy about the arc that uh, Cullen Bunn decided to start with this, and that's only a personal preference thing because I didn't like Circle of Four, and uh, this is a follow-up to Circle of Four. However, it needed to happen because there was a big deal made in Circle of Four about how uh, Venom now has, has been marked by, um, by uh, Mephisto, 
and so uh, eventually this was going to have to come back, and uh, Hellstrom shows up in this, and um, we're now finally get, getting the, or not really finally, it hasn't been that long, but we're getting the aftermath of all that kind of, of, of all that stuff, and um, I don't know, I, I just, I don't personally, I personally like more of kind of the street level stuff with this version of, of Venom, as opposed to uh, the big giant supernatural, um, you know, heavy hellish stuff, but uh, that's okay, this needed to happen, and um, it's good, uh, and... I don't really have anything else to say about it right now without, uh, you know, giving a bunch of stuff away. Um, it, it does have a really, really great reveal at the end. And I will say uh, that, that um, this is going back a little bit to uh, more old-school um, symbiote ideas, too. And I, I have missed some of that with Venom. Uh, sometimes I have to remind myself, oh, yeah, it's the symbiote. Nettie Brock used to have it. It's not just it's not just Flash Thompson uh, in, a, uh, in a battle suit. Uh, although, you know, I love this character so much that I almost could deal with it just being, you know, Flash Thompson in some sort of a mechanized battle suit. Uh, but anyway, um, still liking that book, still on it, and uh, looking forward to more. And the last thing I want to talk about is Batman Incorporated number three, The Return of Matches Malone. Um, I really like that uh, Morrison decided to do this, to bring back Matches Malone, and it is so much fun to uh, see how Bruce Wayne changes his whole persona to uh, to go into these clubs and talk to all these you know bad men uh, with this really kind of kind of old-fashioned kind of smooth talking mafia boss type talk and uh, Morrison's got a great voice for it um, basically what happens in this is uh, matches Malone is trying to matches Malone Bruce Wayne as matches Malone is going undercover and trying to figure out everything he can figure out about Leviathan uh, the end <laughs> that's pretty much what's what's going on here and there's also a whole lot of, of stuff going on with Damien and, of course, Damien upset because um, Robin has been grounded and he kind of tries to take things into his own hands and I won't uh, spoil what exactly he does with that. Um, all I'll say is he uh, he takes something that Dick Grayson says, I think, um, not the way Dick Grayson intended it and uh, and then um, he, wackiness ensues. Um, that's all I'm going to say about this. Uh, this series continues to be really great. And um, I'm really happy with it. The only thing, of course, is I still can't figure out if it's really part of New 52 continuity or not, because it still feels like Morrison just doing what he was doing, um, with the exception of some costume stuff, with um, with uh, Batman Inc. and with uh, all of his Batman stuff uh, pre-New 52. Uh, but that's good. I, at least it's a little bit more follow followable. Uh, you can pretty much... I'd like to see Tim Drake show up in this one time just to see if in this Tim Drake is still Robin or, or had ever been Robin. But anyway, uh, that's about all I have to talk about today. Uh, thanks as always for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you found it informative. And if there's anything you'd ever like to see me review on the vault, you can always send that to my P.O. Box. That's Geek Pollution, P.O. Box 14183, Lenexa, Kansas 66285. I review comics every day, new and old. And if you happen to be working on your own independent comic, uh, be sure to send that my way and I'll be happy. Happy to review it for you. Thanks as always for watching. I'm Captain Logan, and happy reading.